Ah, okay. That's all. Great. Uh, so the subject for my talk this evening uh, emerges from research that I conducted among Basmati farmers, Indian rice retailers, agricultural scientists, and government regulators in and around the Dune Valley in the northern Indian state of Uttarakhand. Uh, in India and Pakistan, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, um, basmati is historically associated with long-grained aromatic rice grown in the sub-Himalayan regions of the Indo-Gangetic Plain. My own interest in basmati came about as part of my larger study of the development of commercial organic agriculture in Uttarakhand, uh, which is the, will be the focus of the book. Um, in recent years, the state government of Uttarakhand has vigorously promoted certified organic agriculture, and large Indian rice retailers have formed contract arrangements with groups of Indian farmers in the Dune Valley uh, to produce organic basmati for export to countries in the Middle East, uh, in Europe uh, and North America, as well as for sale within India. Um, and so this is a photo um, where you can see representatives from uh, the rice retailer that procures basmati uh, inspecting an organic field. And what they're looking for here uh, is actually not whether, they're not assessing whether or not the f it is organic. That takes place through uh, a different mode of organic inspections and certification. Uh, but they're looking for signs of disease and nutrient deficiency in the basmati crop, um, which would affect the yield as well as the, the quality of the harvested grain. So contract farming uh, of organic basmati for export uh, is something that's relatively new in the Dune Valley. But their Dune basmati has a long-standing reputation for being among the finest produced. Its distinctive qualities, in particular its aroma and its taste, are attributed, attributed to the particular climate, soils, and water of the Dune Valley. Despite its fame, the production of basmati in the Dune Valley dwindled in the wake of India's Green Revolution. And so, in many ways, the advent of organic <coughs> agriculture uh, has led to a, a renaissance uh, and a revival of the cultivation of a grain for which the va valley has long been famous. Um, but paradoxically, as the cultivation of basmati experiences this sort of renaissance, it's become increasingly difficult to find older cultivars of basmati in the shops and markets of Dharadun itself. When I visited Dharadun in 2016, after having conducted over 20 months of field work there between 2000, 2005 and 2008, I discovered that many of those small shops that I had uh, seen there during that time had virtually disappeared. It was only after slipping off the busy thoroughfares near Dharadun's railway station, where many of these vendors had been located, that I came across a few shops with sun-bleached fading signboards on which the words best quality bas Dharadun rice and Dharadun's delicious basmati rice were still just barely visible. Among these establishments, Ram Kumar's store, which is pictured in the center of the photo here, has stood near Dharadun's railway station for over 60 years. A family business spanning three generations. In 2016, it was squeezed between a pharmacy on one side and a mobile phone and money transfer vendor on another. One of the few merchants who still sources local basmati cultivars directly from farmers in the vicinity of the, the capital city, Ram Kumar told me that these older cultivars are disappearing as the expansion of the city in the wake of Uttarakhand's formation in the year 2000 uh, consumed prime agricultural land. Earlier, he told me, in an account that I'd heard uh, on a number of occasions, basmati rice grown in Dharadun was short-grained, but it had a good smell. Shifting to speak of the long-grained commercial varieties, 
and to even more recent hybrid varieties developed to meet growing domestic and world demand for basmati. Ram Kumar lamented that now the basmati grain is long and fine, but it lacks aroma, a loss that he attributed not only to the characteristics of these commercial varieties, but also to the changing climatic and ecological conditions of the Dune Valley. The area's once famous short grain basmati then was quite literally disappearing from the valley on shop signs and in the fields. One month before I visited Ram Kumar's shop in February 2016, Basmati was awarded a geographical indication by India's Intellectual Property Appellate Board. This designation came after a long and contested process, and it conferred state recognition of and legal protection for Basmati rice grown in India's <coughs> sub-Himalayan region, so in places like the Dune Valley. Geographical indications are a fairly recent form of intellectual property uh, established under the WTO, um, although they draw kind of on more established uh, forms of protection like the uh, Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée, um, although they are distinct from it. Uh, GIs are founded on the rationale that to quote the definition offered by the WTO, a product's quality, reputation, or other characteristics can be determined by where it comes from. In this respect, geographical indications are thought to be capable of supporting and protecting products whose distinctiveness is closely connected to their places of production. Um, so from a certain standpoint, one might think of geographical indications as perhaps offering a legal means to prevent the appropriation of regionally or culturally distinctive products, um, or even kind of thinking with the theme of this series uh, to decolonize them. The question I'd like to explore today is how can we make sense of the disappearance of older Basmati cultivars and land races from the Dune Valley at the very moment when the place-based character of Basmati is lauded and legally recognized by the Indian state in the form of a geographical indication, and when the Dune Valley itself has become an important site for the production of certified organic basmati. In this respect, the fading signboard of Ram Kumar's storefront, I think, offers a cue for thinking about changes in the political, economic, and cultural milieu in which basmati circulates. To connect the research that I'll talk about tonight with the theme of the seminar series, Decolonizing Natural Resource Governance, these changes in Basmati circulation have to do with what might be thought of as interrelated processes of its colonization, decolonization, and I'll argue its recolonization. Central to these processes, uh, I suggest, is the definition and the delimitation of what Basmati is what it can and cannot be. And so my talk tonight springs in a sense from, from this sense of puzzlement and a question that emerged during the course of my field work, um, which seems obvious but became less and less obvious to me as I, um, as I progressed with my research, and that is, what is basmati? Um, so I frame my own approach uh, and inquiry around this question uh, around two questions in the title of my talk. Uh, what's in a name and what's in a grain? So one observation that I start with is that for much of its history, Basmati has harbored an expansiveness that belies the smallness and seeming simplicity of grains of rice. Contemporary contract farming of organic Basmati in the Dune Valley builds on a much deeper history of, its, of producing, consuming, and commoditizing basmati in the subcontinent. Uh, an 18th century poem by the famed Punjabi poet Waris Shah is known as the first written record of basmati. And the grain finds mention, along with other fine rice, in an account of, of the wedding of the poem's heroine. From records such as this, it's apparent 
that like other aromatic rice, Basmati's elite associations and its connotations of luxury are well established, having been consumed by and cultivated for royalty and nobility in, pa in Pakistan and northern India, um, and sometimes under the direct supervision of these authorities. While Basmati was clearly prized and highly valued, there's little record, though, about whether and how the grain may have circulated as a commodity prior to British colonial rule. Opportunities for such circulation certainly existed. In Mughal India, rice was exported to Central Asia from the Punjab, um, although it's not typically noted as a significant export for the empire. The Mughal period also saw the elaboration of a land revenue system, first on the basis of in-kind payments and later through cash payments. Um, so in-kind payments of grain and then subsequently cash payments. The collection of revenue, and particularly in the form of cash, relied importantly on an extensive and well-established system of rural markets and cash cropping of cotton, oil seeds, sugarcane, and indigo. Despite the commoditization then of certain crops in uh, pre-colonial uh, British India, Basmati appears to have remained outside emergent systems of land revenue collection and circulated instead in a regionally delimited realm of exchange that was more restricted to royalty, nobility, and religious authority. By the late 19th century, however, Basmati grown in the Dune Valley was recognized as a superior grain in British colonial records. Atkinson's Gazetteer documents three main varieties of basmati grown in Daradun, noting that the kyari furnishes rice of the best quality. The seeds are sown in nurseries in April, May, and the young plants are transferred to, in the following two months to well-irrigated fields where they are carefully weeded. The principal varieties are the Ramjaring and Basmati, and these grow best in the warm valleys and along the great rivers where there is much moisture. But although recognized to be of fine quality, Basmati from the region didn't appear to participate substantially in centuries-old circuits of trans-Himalayan trade in the region, nor was it a significant agricultural commodity during the period of British imperial rule. In northern India generally then, basmati doesn't appear to have been a significant cash or revenue paying crop or to have circulated, or to have circulated widely in a commodity form. Instead, it appears more as a prestige crop um, that participated in a different order of exchange and tribute and was produced, traded, and consumed mainly at a local or regional level. Its more limited circulation corresponded historically with a more open and perhaps a looser definition of basmati, uh, one in which its value was determined not only by its aromatic or physical qualities, but also by its participation in noble or religious spheres of exchange. Today, however, basmati is a mass commodity, but these elite associations are reinscribed through brand names like Trophy, Royal, or Taj Mahal in the relatively new but burgeoning market, uh, domestic market for branded rice in India. Despite its renown in India over several centuries, the mass commoditization and global circulation of basmati is a relatively recent phenomenon. As the anthropologist uh, Denis Vidal has noted, it dates really only to the 1980s. Indeed, Basmati exports have grown exponentially for over the past four decades. For example, from April to December 1981, India exported about 165,000 tons of Basmati, while in a 12-month period in 2018 to 2019, India exported over four, mil, uh, 4 million metric tons of basmati to more than 150 countries. And the value of these sales was nearly 5 billion US dollars, 
which accounts for over 20% of the value of all food and agricultural products within the purview of India's Agricultural and Processed Food Products Export Development Authority, um, which is the agency responsible for regulating many of India's uh, food exports. So it accounts for a significant proportion uh, of the value of uh, India's food exports. The recent mass commoditization of basmati for export is directly connected with post-green revolution initiatives in plant breeding. Following the green revolution, breeding efforts that had sought to uh, enhance crop yields primarily were expanded to improve the quality of characteristics of rice varieties, and in particular basmati, which commanded a premium in domestic and export markets. <coughs> Um, the kinds of quality standards that became important in these plant breeding initiatives included, among other things, Basmati's physical characteristics, such as the length, breadth, shape, and color of the grain, its behavior upon cooking, including its absorption of water, uh, its volume expansion and kernel elongation, uh, its nutritional qualities, such as its protein content, and its milling qualities. From the 1980s uh, through to the present day, the, the uh, development of basmati varieties uh, has, has accelerated tremendously. Um, and so this table is difficult to read, but uh, it shows um, a list of 29 government notified uh, varieties of basmati. Um, and one of the things that's interesting, I think, about this list, although you may not be able to read it, um, is that in a 40-year period from 1969 to 2009, there were 14 varieties of basmati that received notification. Um, whereas in the period from 2010 to 2016, there were 15 varieties um, that received notification. So one can see just within the last decade uh, the tremendous acceleration and proliferation uh, of breeding, plant breeding, and, the, and uh, the notification of basmati varieties. Um, and many of these more recently notified varieties are hybrids, um, such as Pusa basmati 1121. The rapid growth of the domestic market for branded basmati, or for branded rice in India more generally, uh, has also driven the diversification um, and the proliferation of commercially marketed basmati varieties. Like the expansion of basmati exports, the emergence of domestic demand for branded rice uh, is relatively recent. Um, so, for example, the food Indian uh, food retail company, which procures organic basmati from farmers in the Dune Valley, was only incorporated in 1989 when it established its own flagship brand of basmati. Um, and across India in 2007, sales of branded rice accounted <coughs> for one third of the total volume and one half of the total value. Um, of the domestic market for basmati. Um, more recent figures, uh, later than 2007, I found difficult to come by, but I think one can still sort of see the ongoing kind of strength and growth of this market for branded rice by the increasing number of um, private food companies that are sort of seeking a slice of this, this market. Amid the growing demand for basmati within both domestic and export markets, uh, both private corporations and national governments have sought to establish exclusive proprietary claims to basmati. Uh, so many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the 1997 um, award of a patent to the US company Rice Tech uh, for basmati lines that were developed using Indian and Pakistani germplasm. Um, and the subsequent public and legal contestation uh, that it provoked. So although much of the patent was subsequently revoked, uh, it spurred the government of India and the government of Pakistan to take steps to prevent its future appropriation. Um, and here I think it's worth remembering or re worth recalling 
that Vandana Shiva is described by Opiracy, um, and more generally, the move to award intellectual property over seeds and plant varieties as a form of colonization, as the colonization of the seed. Um, so in this context, geographical indications may be seen um, and were certainly seen by um, these governments as a possible way of preventing uh, such colonization. But these efforts to avert the colonization of Basmati have only intensified the efforts to define what it is um, in ways that I will argue amount to a certain kind of recolonization. So the rapid growth in exports and the global circulation of Basmati has also at times been accompanied by allegations of adulteration uh, and the widespread use of admixtures or blending uh, of different rice varieties in exported rice that is labeled Basmati. In response, international food standards authorities and those in exporting and importing countries have developed pre precise definitions about what is and isn't basmati uh, through both binding and voluntary regu regulatory frameworks. The emergence of basmati as a global commodity is thus associated with progressive moves to specify and to delimit what it is, marking a break with a past in which basmati's meanings and its qualities were rather more open. These recent regulatory efforts quite literally reshape what kinds of rice may be considered basmati. To set parameters for export quality basmati, for example, in 2003, the government of India developed standards that included the minimum pre-cooked grain length, the minimum length breadth ratio, and the min minimum elongation ratio after cooking. These parameters were intended as thresholds that would ensure Basmati's continued reputa reputation in export markets as a famously slender, long-grained, non-sticky aromatic rice. Importing countries have also adopted similar standards. In the UK, uh, which is the eighth largest importer of Basmati, a voluntary code of practice offers the following definition, quote, Basmati is the customary name for certain varieties of rice that are grown in, um, exclusively in specific areas of the Indo-Gangetic Plains, which currently includes the Punjab on both sides of the Indian and Pakistani border, Jammu, <coughs> Haryana, Uttaranchal, or Uttarakhand, and Western Uttar Pradesh in India. Crucially, this definition of Basmati goes on to limit it to certain varieties as well. Um, so the UK standards note that these varieties must be notified either by the government of India or the government of Pakistan. Um, they must have at least one parent, which is a historic land race variety, and they must meet specific quality criteria for basmati. Um, so in a sense, the UK standards limit what can be called basmati to the 29 varieties in India to the 29 varieties um, that were on the list I, I showed earlier. Um, and furthermore, historic land race varieties or traditional varieties are also varieties that are, are indicated on that list. Um, so the kind of bounds of tradition um, and land race are, are also kind of contained within that list. They don't exceed it. These regulations ensure that in UK markets, the term basmati can only be applied to a narrow range then of notified rice varieties that display specific characteristics and are grown in particular geographic regions. The advent of geographic indication, however, creates other kinds of compulsions to define what basmati is. These efforts have also entailed the mobilization of scientific expertise to effectively nationalize Basmati as Indian in a manner that departs from and remains at odds with understandings of farmers in Uttarakhand who cultivate the crop. During the course of my fieldwork, local lore about the origins of Dehradun Basmati was recounted to me by a somewhat surprising range of Dune Valley farmers 
and staff of regional NGOs working to conserve seed biodiversity. These accounts cast the grain for which Theradun is famous as an exotic cultivar introduced to the Dune Valley by an exiled Afghan Amir, Dost Mohammed Khan, after his capture by the British following the Anglo-Afghan War in 1839. A local Theradun historian provides the only documented record of this account in English, reporting that the exiled Amir brought with him seeds from Kunar Valley in northeastern Afghanistan, which took well to the climate and soils of the Dune Valley. In the agrarian history and imagination of Dune Valley residents and cultivators, therefore, uh, their Dune Basmati, very kind of locally specific cultivars, are caught up with and owe their existence to a wider regional political and imperial history of the 19th century, one that connects the Dune Valley in significant and perhaps unexpected ways with the Central Asian terrain of the Great Game. The agrarian cosmopolitanism displayed by farmers as they noted the origin of Dune Valley Basmati in Afghanistan stands in contrast to those held by some of the region's renowned rice scientists who contend that Basmati originates in the Indian subcontinent, not in Central Asia, and with some claiming its origins in the Dune Valley itself. This is evident in peer-reviewed published accounts, and it was emphasized to me on several occasions as I met with rice breeders and scientists at G.B. Pant Agricultural University in Uttarakhand. G.S. Kush, an eminent rice breeder and genetic, uh, rice breeder and, and rice geneticist based at the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines, identifies the Himalayan foothills of present-day Uttarakhand, Bihar, and the Nepali Terai as the center of diversity for the group of aromatic uh, rice to which Basmati belongs. Um, and this is an image from his paper here. So uh, from this region, he contends, quote, aromatic rices spread northwestward to Punjab in India and Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran and Iraq, <coughs> northeastward to Bangladesh and Myanmar, and the Indian states of Orissa, Bengal, Assam, and Manipur. The westward distribution occurred to other states of India, such as Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, and Gujarat. So it's kind of precisely the opposite direction um, of the accounts given by uh, residents and farmers in the Dune Valley. Um, while the origins of Basmati generally and Dharadun Basmati specifically uh, remain unclear to me, I, I wasn't able to kind of authoritatively establish uh, the origins of Basmati. I think it's nonetheless worth reflecting <coughs> on the stark differences between a cosmopolitan local lore that acknowledges the historical movement of plant germplasm across present day national borders and their entanglement with geopolitics and imperial history. And what is, by contrast, a more provincial theory offered by internationally renowned rice breeders. Here, it's significant that many of the rice scientists and breeders were consulted by the government of India uh, during its efforts to establish grounds for, um, for making the claim to a geographical indication for Basmati. And the success of this application hinged on the ability to demonstrate origin um, and particularly locating the origins of Basmati within northern India through documented published accounts. Um, so sort of documentary peer-reviewed evidence uh, of the Indian origins of Basmati was critical in, in securing the GI. If scientific accounts thus nationalize Basmati's origins as Indian, they also shift how Basmati's key qualities are known and defined. As I conducted research in the Dune Valley in 2007 and 2008, residents of Asanpur, a village that had acquired a particular fame for Basmati, gave me small bags of what they called Mota Basmati, 
which was different from the one that they were growing commercially uh, as part of the organic program. And here you can see um, the difference between Mota Basmati on the right and the commercially grown organic variety. So Mota Basmati was bred um, and cultivated through farmer selection. It wasn't one of the government notified varieties developed by a public or private sector breeding program. It wasn't sanctioned um, for official commercial sale. Villagers grew this cultivar for their own consumption and often spoke of how its aroma was superior to that of any of the commercially available varieties. Motha Basmati shared many of the characteristics of government notified commercial varieties, especially its elongation upon cooking and its distinctive fragrance. But in Hindi, motha means fat or thick. And as the word suggests, and as the photo shows, prior to cooking, the grain was short and bold or thick, not long and slender, as is more typical of commercially available grains. Despite its appearance, residents of Asanpur spoke of the wondrous aroma of Mokha Basmati, recalling childhood memories of how its scent uh, would waft through the village when it was cooked. Well, their Dun Basmati then is often described as if it were a single variety of rice. Experienced culti cultivators discerned differing and different qualities across Basmati produced in different locales within the Dun Valley. Though named for a physical property of the grain, its thick kernel, Mota Basmati's qualities were clearly also understood to exceed these parameters. Rather than being fixed in the grain, they were, they were understood to be part of a more complex ecological interplay, not just in abstract terms of climate, soil, and water, but of the wind's specific direction at certain times of day, the quality of sunlight, the properties of water, and the courses along which water flowed. So for example, um, farmers would distinguish between the properties of water drawn from different uh, rivers via irrigation canals uh, or down from springs and streams uh, in nearby forested hills. Yet the differences I started to perceive between the notified varieties of basmati cultivated for organic markets and Asanpur's Motha basmati only made me, uh, made me question and, and really kind of brought forth this question of what is basmati. In the summer of 2008, I brought this puzzle, along with a few grains of Motha Basmati, to a rice geneticist at G.B. Panth Agricultural University. Our conversation was initially wide-ranging, and he acknowledged that the term Basmati is, as he put it, a confusion. He elaborated, if you go to the rural area, you will find the Basmati of every village. Every village has its own Basmati. Um, and so this seemed to me to be the perfect moment to ask him about Motha Basmati. Taking out a small sample of the grains that I carried with me, I was curious to see, uh, but also thoroughly unprepared for his reaction. Because he was a rice geneticist, I somehow thought that he would maybe acknowledge the variability and diversity of Basmati. But his initial reaction was dismissive. He inspected the small, thick grains before him, looked up at me and said, but madam, this is not technically basmati. He went on to explain his reasoning. The grain is very coarse. There is a lot of mixture of other grains. And then more than 75% of the grains, they are short and they are bold. Pressing on this assessment, I told him that despite the appearance of the grain, uh, it elongated significantly when it was cooked. Firm in his evaluation, he replied that many such local cultivars elongate substantially, even, he said, too much, and that this does not make them basmati. Nonetheless, he asked his lab assistant to cook the grains I brought with me, and his skepticism was tempered a bit when we observed that the grain, as he put it, 
behaved like basmati. So after cooking, it resembled basmati, lengthening and becoming fine and flaky. Despite the way in which cooking transformed the grain, however, he maintained that this could not be true basmati on account of the length and the breadth of the uncooked grain. Rice, he noted, is the only grain that's consumed predominantly in an unprocessed state, that is, without substantial milling or grinding. Um, so unlike wheat and maize, which are other widely consumed grains in northern India. Thus, he explained that the size and shape of the uncooked grain, and not just the cooked grain itself, have become integral to characterizing Basmati's physical qualities. In projecting Asankur's Motha Basmati as Basmati, for want of the right kind of qualities, this rice geneticist no doubt likely had in mind India's export quality standards. Um, which I mentioned earlier. These standards stipulate not only the length breadth, length breadth ratio and elongation ratio, but also percentage parameters for foreign matter, other rice varieties, other grains, and so on. What's crucial here is that these export quality standards now also delimit the scope of India's geographical indication for Basmati. Basmati that's eligible for protection through geographical indication then must first be a government notified variety and second must conform to these export quality standards. The rise of Basmati as a globally traded grain has had two major and paradoxical effects. First, it has shifted the locus of quality from sensory aromatic properties to the physical characteristics of the grain, and to a geography that's defined spatially rather than through socio-ecological relations. Under the contract farming arrangements that underlie the production of organic basmati, farmers must now not only plant certain government-notified varieties, but through their labors must ensure that the grains they cultivate are not discolored, black, green, striped, broken, and so on. Um, and this final slide um, shows um, one of the problems that may occur. So this is um, a disease called brown spot, which as you can see actually leaves a brown spot on the rice um, and blemishes the, um, the milled grain. Um, and so this creates a problem um, for farmers because it means that their, their rice then doesn't conform to these export quality standards if a certain proportion um, of it is blemished in this way. Um, so a second, I guess, effect of um, the rise of Basmati as a globally traded grain um, uh, and something that's resulted from processes of standardization that structure geographical indication is that local cultivars like Motha Basmati uh, have been expelled from recent regulatory definitions of the very category of Basmati. Ironically, as India's geographical indication is promoted to protect Basmati's distinctiveness, the most particular and distinctive kinds of basmati grown in the Dune Valley are no longer considered basmati at all. Increasingly, basmati is defined then through the interlocking of regulatory relations that become ingrained in agricultural practices as farmers who wish to participate in contract farming arrangements are obliged to grow particular varieties of rice and to ensure that their crop conforms to export quality standards. To be sure, previous efforts to colonize Basmati, so to speak, have been loudly contested, as in the rice tech patent dispute. But today, what could be seen as Basmati's recolonization, this time by the Indian states and private sector food companies, is arguably more subtle and surreptitious. 
It occurs as Dune Valley farmers replace Mocha Basmaki with government notified varieties and meet even more invisibly, adapt their labors to regulatory standards so as to coax from their fields the slender, fine, and unblemished grains that we may consume. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. It's a really fascinating uh, yeah, study, and it really shows us how we can see the world in a grain of rice in some ways. And, some ways. and um, uh, yeah, um, I'm really very interested in this and not at all knowledgeable about it. Uh, but it's a subject which um, it's, it's, it can relate to everyone's life, uh, and it's something that, yeah, it, it, it's a real example of how the political economy of food can be told uh, through you know, one, one single uh, commodity. So I, um, as, I, as I just mentioned, um, I'm not at all an expert in this area. My questions are mostly for more information and, and for learning for myself, learning more uh, about it. Because one of the really interesting um, aspects of uh, your um, presentation was the link with sort of class status uh, mm -hmm. and how uh, both sort of domestic consumption has historically been, you know, a marker uh, of class status, um, and uh, yeah, and then how uh, it uh, it gets sort of shifted from from that to sort of nationalist discourses and stuff. So I, my first sort of question was, what accounts for uh, you said that uh, there was, an, this is just an attempt to draw out that class link more explicitly, it's there throughout the paper. But you said that um, it was not a commodity for very long, historically, right? And that's precisely because it was a prestige uh, crop and it was, it's, restrict, it's restricted circulation added to, in a sense, it's prestige, right? And it's, it's, um, and then later, what we see more recently is a growing demand. You said there's, there's been a growing demand, uh, if you like, for uh, uh, this from both domestic and export markets. Yeah. So what does that growing demand then tell us about the class, uh, if you like, implications of, of this crop? What, what, what the, or, or the changing structures of uh, class domestically mm -hmm. and internationally? Yeah, because that's that's one shift that you say that now, now this much greater domestic demand. The second point that again it's more for my own um, uh, understanding uh, that on the one hand we see this uh, move towards standardization that is through this GI process. Is that is that correct? Have I understood that correctly? That's yeah. That that, that GI thing is a key. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess the GI is building on other processes of standardization, like sure. export quality. And, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so my sense of that story was that there is a sort of reduction in what is acceptably basmati, right? Mm -hmm. So what's, that's, that's, that's doing that. But on the other hand, and there was also that very interesting table which shows there's a proliferation of the varieties, recognized varieties of basmati, mm -hmm. right? So that's gone alongside the notification of many, many more varieties. Mm -hmm. So why would one assume that, um, that, that, that that standardization is necessarily reducing the field rather mm -hmm. than, you know, expanding, uh, mm -hmm. also creating sort of spaces for um, expansion? Um, so, I mean, I'll stop there. I'm sure there are more uh, questions from the audience, but I think that that's, it's a really uh, terrific subject and one that I uh, look forward to reading more about in a moment. Thank you. Should I answer? Or should oh, I as, you, you as you prefer. Would you should we take more questions? Uh, yeah. Do you, you, is that okay yeah, for you? Yeah. 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 Thank you for your talk. I was just wondering under what circumstances to serve as the rice geneticists interact with local <coughs> farmers if they ever do, because that would sort of make, like, are they ever sort of dealing with these farmers as sort of experts, or is it always sort of pet teaching? And I was wondering if there were any efforts to include local varieties onto the notified list. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Great. 
questions, all of them. Should I take those, those sort of four questions sure. there? Shall I? Yeah. yeah. No, thank you for, for them. Um, so I think in terms of, I guess one thing I should say is that in a way, because I came at this through really looking at organic agriculture, the interest in Basmati and geographical indications um, and branded rice in India, that these are kind of interests that develop during the course of my research, but sort of as one branch that I haven't, in, that I've not had thus far a chance to explore as much as I'd like to. Um, but it's something that I hope to, to do more with in the future. Um, but in terms, so on that note, I haven't looked specifically at um, the questions of class and uh, consumption um, of basmati and what what um, the growing demand for basmati or for branded basmati in India tells us about class. Um, I guess I think there's maybe two things that are um, that one could think about in terms of class and this demand for basmati. Um, so one is, I suppose, the the growth of a middle class in India and the fact that um, uh, certainly basmati is becoming a grain that more people can afford to purchase um, at some, you know, to some degree. Um, what's also interesting is um, is the branding itself of basmati. Um, so I had the opportunity to um, interview uh, some of the kind of marketing executives who were working in the company that is procuring organic basmati. Um, and I ended up spending an afternoon looking at advertisements for branded basmati that they were selling. Um, and they were very, there's a very kind of conscious way in which different brands, um, Trophy, Royal, Taj Mahal, are kind of targeted um, to different segment parts of the population, right, uh, on a class basis. So there's a way in which um, I think de there, there may be a kind of independent demand for basmati, but that, the, that demand is also being kind of cultivated um, and class itself is also sort of being produced or reproduced partly through the marketing strategies um, of these of these food companies. One one might mm -hmm. might argue um, again, it's something that I need to explore more. But that's kind of one possible thought. Um, I think maybe the second point about class or another what could also be interesting to explore um, is, is the way in which the consumption of certain foods is a way of producing or, or expressing class status and distinction. Uh, so Pierre Bourdieu has famously written about this and many other people have looked at how food um, and food consumption practices are a way of marking um, class or other differences and distinctions. Um, and one could perhaps kind of take a similar approach to thinking about um, the growing uh, demand for, for basmati. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it could be, and in terms of um, food studies, it could be kind of an, an interesting way of thinking about um, the production and reproduction of, of class. Um, in, uh, in India and the participation of this kind of growing sector of private food retail in, in that. Um, I think in relation to, yeah, the point about the, you know, what, whether this is truly a narrowing of the field, given that we've seen such a kind of proliferation of, um, of New, newer variety, new varieties of basmati. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, that's definitely, I completely agree with that. Um, I don't, I, yeah, I, I think 
you know, what, what I shouldn't suggest that this is just a kind of narrowing um, and a reduction of what Basmati is, but what seems significant is um, who, who is behind the, whose varieties are recognized, right? What are the kind of conditions under which um, cultivars, varieties become eligible for recognition? And I guess what's important about that list is it's all varieties that are developed um, in um, informal plant breeding programs. Um, so, and so far, to the best of my knowledge, this is um, th these plant breeding initiatives, unlike um, what one hears with respect to plant breeding, uh, sort of in a wider sense uh, in India, but these initiatives have been mainly public sector um, initiatives. So the private sector hasn't stepped in in a big way to um, develop um, newer varieties of basmati. Um, but I mean, I think another, not, there's certainly links between, and increasingly close links between public sector breeding and private food retail. Um, so it could be interesting to kind of get at how that shapes um, the, the development of these new varieties. But I guess the key thing here is that the, uh, maybe it, it seems to be more the kind of ways in which local cultivars are kind of expelled from, are excluded from the category of basmati. So basmati becomes that which is contained within a list, the, this government notified list of varieties, that which um, you know, observes particular kind of physical characteristics and so on. Um, and maybe that kind of addresses the last question um, that you answered, or that you asked about the inclusion of um, local cultivator cultivars on the notified list of notified five varieties. Um, again, to the best of my knowledge, that hasn't happened, and I think. Um, Philippe would be able to speak to this more, um, uh, more as well, but one of the reasons is that often these local cultivars may not be kind of stable um, in the same way that varieties bred in a formal, you know, under formal plant breeding kind of uh, conditions are. Um, so there's certain reasons why um, why the local cultivars haven't been included on the list. But what's sort of um, curious is that, in a sense, initially, I think the geographical indication for Basmati in India was seen as a possible means um, for protecting you know, traditional varieties, local cultivars, biodiversity, and so on, um, certainly in response to the patent. And that's kind of one sort of discourse that's existed around GIs more broadly. Um, but I think from what I, I can see, what the Basmati, the experience so far of the Basmati geographical indication tells us is that it's working quite differently, right? And so that rather than ex including um, and being inclusive of um, uh, varieties and cultivars produced under diverse conditions. In a sense, it's perhaps narrowing the conditions under which basmati um, can be considered basmati. Um, and then the right question, your question about the rice geneticists. Um, so, I mean, I think because this state agricultural university is located in, in Uttarakhand, um, you know, certainly um, these weren't scientists who were, you know, working all the time in a lab um, and they conducted research uh, in, in and around the Dune Valley. Um, I still think, though, that that itself doesn't, um, it doesn't necessarily transform the research process itself. It didn't mean that the, there was, you know, res the 
plant breeding and efforts were um, participatory uh, in, a, in any sense. So I think um, in some ways the, the, and what was interesting is in a way the, the views of these rice geneticists seemed to fall far more in line with um, the kind of policies of the government of India, right, rather than with the kind of diversity that might be observable in the field. Um, I don't know if that answers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Were there more other questions? Yeah. I have uh, two random unlinked questions. So one is uh, one is about the history that you were trying to trace uh -huh. the origins of. I'm wondering if, if you traced it back to Afghanistan to see if there were varieties there um, which had similar uh, indicators, which perhaps um, kind of establishes that the origins lie somewhere there. Uh, but the other question I have really is about when the paper looks at the exclusion mm -hmm. as a process of, of recolonization. Uh, the question I have is really um, would it would the story be different if you told it from the contract farming uh, and what the contract farming process actually does? Mm -hmm. uh, did you dwell deep, deeper into the into the that contract farming? Uh, you know the contracts. Yeah. And what is happening to the farmers with that process itself? Is that even part of the reason? Yeah. Uh, no. Thank you for those for those questions. Um, I on the the origins of Basmati in Afghanistan, it's something that I would, I, yeah, I find really fascinating how this account has emerged. Um, and um, I haven't been able, though, to trace it back to the Kunar Valley in Afghanistan. Um, I've tried to find kind of records or other ways of getting at you know, what kinds of rice are cultivated um, uh, in this region, but it's, I think, you know, without going um, to Afghanistan and kind of working in, in that region, it may be difficult to kind of establish, um, establish those connections. But I think it, you know, it's something um, that could be, you know, it's, a, it's, it's offering a very different kind of um, account of, um, of Basmati's origins, and I think precisely because it's one that's so enmeshed in um, a particular kind of geopolitical history that understands the, this region, which is today very fractured and divided in a way that is kind of re really quite connected. Um, you know, I think it could, I, it's something that I think would be, um, would be interesting to do. Um, so maybe this will be, this is, so this isn't my book, I have to <laughs> say, um, but maybe it could develop into something um, in the future. Um, and in terms, so in terms of the contract farming, this was actually something I did look at more in the context of uh, the, the production of certified organic basmati. Um, and so in term, I guess your question was about exclusion. The the question was, could, could the same story be said to do a recolonization? Okay. To, to the lens of contract work. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, uh, farmers in the Dune Valley had a very kind of ambivalent experience with contract farming. Um, in fact, in the years that I conducted my research, which was principally um, 2007 to 2008, um, many farmers in a certain part of the dune, well actually many farmers who had grouped together in these farmers federations um, to sell their basmati to, uh, to this rice retail company. Um, actually reneged on the contract. So um, so they, uh, at the moment after Basmati is harvested, there, were, there was a series of dates when farmers were supposed to come to a particular 
procurement point at the block headquarters or the Mandi, and representative from the company was there, um, and the rice samples of the rice were inspected. It was weighed. There was, you know, this was kind of a moment of transaction. But so I was there for um, this procurement in 2007, um, and many of the farmers didn't turn up. Um, and so what I was told at the time, um, or some of the reasons that were given at the time, um, well, one, from the company's point of view, they said, oh, well, they're just um, you know, diverting it to their family or saying that you know, they need it for weddings, and so they sell, um, they're selling less to us. Um, so there was a certain amount of disgruntlement on the part of the company. Um, but in fact, you know, farmers had particular reasons for not honoring the contract. One was that the contract price of Basmati, they said, wasn't competitive with, at the time, what was a fairly strong market price for Basmati. Um, and in particular, that the extra cost of labor that they, labor costs that they incurred um, because they couldn't apply um, sort of herbicides, weed, uh, control weeds, um, and so on. They had to hire manual labor, um, that these costs weren't adequately compensated in the price they were receiving. Um, some, there were four farmers federations, um, so these were kind of unit, like units of group certification and contract farming that included at the time around 400 farmers in each federation. So in one of the federations, the farmers said they hadn't received their payment from the previous year on time. Um, so it, they're not actually paid in cash at the moment of procurement. Uh, the payment goes to the president of the Farmers Federation, um, and then it's up to the president to distribute it to the members of the federation. Um, so in one instance, um, there were um, there were serious uh, problems with the kind of management of this process, and, and farmers uh, had said they were never paid for basmati that they sold the previous year. Um, so obviously, why would they honor the contract? So there was, um, I guess I wouldn't necessarily see it then as a kind of process of that process of colonization, and uh, because I think in a certain sense, these farmers showed a certain, you know, a fair degree of agency mm -hmm. in how the terms in which they engaged with the contract. Um, a number of them also, because it was so hard to find Basmati in the city of Baradun, um, and because there's sort of concerns and fears among residents, city urban residents of Baradun about um, Basmati that they buy um, being adulterated or being fake, um, they would sometimes drive out to, to these farms to just buy directly from farmers themselves. Um, and so I think, you know, there was also in, in some ways an emergence of a more kind of local demand and supply of basmati. Um, and I think in general, yeah, the farmers were either, either able to find ways to resist or abandon the contract. Um, and for some, some also really welcomed the chance to participate in it. Um, you know, welcomed the links to a private, a private rice retailer. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and really spoke very positively of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you think things would have gone without the GI? And do you have a kind of perception in your head of what would be a better situation, like whether you'd keep a GI but with completely overhauling like the untying criteria? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and how much do you think what has happened would have happened anyway just because of things like wider branding mm -hmm. pressures and the whole agricultural commercial industry is a big thing even outside of GI. Yeah. No, I mean, I think 
Those are, yeah, good points. In some ways, I think, um, I mean, in, in some ways, and, you know, I, I put this out there as a thought, so other people may have different ideas or perspectives on this, but I, I think that in some ways, um, it is the, the kind of, yeah, what I've called the mass commoditization of Basmati that's kind of propelled these efforts to standardize it and to stabilize it, even independently of the geographical indication. Um, so, um, so in some ways, the yeah, the fact that you know in the UK um, there there were concerns about the blending of different kinds of rice that was then labeled basmati, um, and that these kinds of concerns that emerge through and in supply chains, whether or not there is an additional GI involved, um, will um, will exist and will kind of create create pressures um, and you know arguably a need for standardizing and stabilizing particular legal or regulatory meanings of you know what is basmati or what isn't basmati. Um, so and those those are arguably necessary for certain kinds of trade. Um, I guess um, I have a, a friend and a colleague who works in Madagascar, and she's looked at the export in very small quantities of Madagascar red rice, um, which is an heirloom rice. So I think you know, it's, it, one can look at different kinds of commodities, right? And in some commodities, like in this instance of, of uh, red rice in Madagascar, that kind of variability um, that you find, it's kind of non-standard quality, the fact that there's you know, variation in color um, of the grain size, that it's not, it's not, or maybe not yet, being subject to these processes of standardization but it exists and part of its value derives from the fact that it is this kind of niche heirloom, um, heirloom rice. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess it, you know, it very much, I think is linked maybe to the particular form of the co form and circuits through which the commodity circulates. Um, but I guess when it comes to um, the geographical indication. So yeah, I think some of this would have gone on anyway, but um, I suppose what's maybe more problematic for me or raises concerns for me is that, um, is that these local cultivars like Mocha Basmati are now not seen as Basmati um, and they're not protective. They're, they have, they're not, they can't be, because they're not bas, they're not seen or recognized as basmati, um, they're not eligible for the same kinds of protection, and yet um, plant breeding programs may use the germplasm of these cultivars to develop um, varieties that are then listed as a notified variety. Um, and that's the case with one of the um, with one of the cultivars that is a government notified variety. So the type three variety, which was actually um, well, the, it was the longer grain that I showed that you saw in the two photos. Um, type three basmati is actually developed from a Dardun cultivar, but it's type three basmati. Um, and so I think, you know, this is, I think this is where the concerns about, you know, the, the way in which local germplasm land races are still a kind of source and material for plant breeding programs um, to use without kind of recognition becomes, um, becomes something 
more of a concern if one is concerned about you know their appropriation in, in the first place. Is that yeah? yeah. Any other questions? No. Uh, so I, I don't know if it, it remains for me to thank uh, our uh, speaker for today uh, for a really stimulating paper, and uh, we look forward to reading more more of her work. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Just great. Thank you. I had more ignorant questions of my own, but I thought I'm not subject. I thought the whole uh, all of you to do this. No, no, it's good. Um, yeah, so that was really interesting. I was also thinking about how, um, you know, why did the demand after the Green Revolution go down in the 